Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos is brought to you by FoundItemClothing.com. Check out their Cthulhu slippers and cool cult film t-shirts. Edited and produced by D.B. Spitzer. Featuring Sarah Fee and D.B. Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod. PGTTCM is part of the Dark Mists Network. Check out all the cool podcasts that we like at darkmyths.org. Subscribe where you subscribe. Like where you like. Rate where you rate. We recommend podbean.com and Apple Podcasts as well. Find PGTTCM on social media at PGTTCM and on YouTube at People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. If you want to donate, go to the Patreon button on pgttcm.podbean.com or paypal.me slash pgttcm. All donations receive an on-air congratulations. Shop at pgttcm.threadless.com or pgttcm.com at the shop. PGTTCM is an exploration of the Cthulhu Mythos, Weird fiction, the gothic literary tradition, classic sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. Thank you. On with the show. Recorded by Nicole Doolin on the web at NicoleDoolin.com The Turn of the Screw by Henry James Chapter 6 It took, of course, more than that particular passage to place us together in presence of what we had now to live with as we could. My dreadful liability to impressions of the order so vividly exemplified, and my companion's knowledge, henceforth, a knowledge half consternation and half compassion of that liability. There had been this evening, after the revelation left me, for an hour, so prostrate, there had been, for either of us, no attendance on any service but a little service of tears and vows, of prayers and promises, a climax to the series of mutual challenges and pledges that had straightway ensued on our retreating together to the schoolroom and shutting ourselves up there to have everything out. The result of our having everything out was simply to reduce our situation to the last rigor of its elements. She herself had seen nothing, not the shadow of a shadow, and nobody in the house but the governess was in the governess's plight. Yet she accepted, without directly impugning my sanity, the truth as I gave it to her, and ended by showing me, on this ground, an awe-stricken tenderness an expression of the sense of my more than questionable privilege, of which the very breath has remained with me as that of the sweetest of human charities. What was settled between us, accordingly, that night, was that we thought we might bear things together, and I was not even sure that, in spite of her exemption, it was she who had the best of the burden. I knew at this hour, I think, as well as I knew later, what I was capable of meeting to shelter my pupils. But it took me some time to be wholly sure of what my honest ally was prepared for, to keep terms with so compromising a contract. I was queer company enough, quite as queer as the company I received, but as I trace over what we went through, I see how much common ground we must have found in the one idea that, by good fortune, could steady us. It was the idea, the second movement, that led me straight out, as I may say, of the inner chamber of my dread. I could take the air in the court, at least, and there... Mrs. Gross could join me. Perfectly can I recall now the particular way strength came to me before we separated for the night. We had gone over and over every feature of what I had seen. He was looking for someone else, you say, 
someone who was not you. He was looking for little miles. A portentous clearness now possessed me. That's whom he was looking for. But how do you know? I know, I know, I know. My exaltation grew. And you know, my dear. She didn't deny this. But I required, I felt, not even so much telling as that. She resumed in a moment, at any rate. What if he should see him? Little Miles? That's what he wants. She looked immensely scared again. The child? Heaven forbid. The man. He wants to appear to them. That he might was an awful conception. And yet, somehow, I could keep it at bay. Which, moreover, as we lingered there, was what I succeeded in practically proving. I had an absolute certainty that I should see again what I had already seen. But something within me said that by offering myself bravely as the sole subject of such experience, by accepting, by inviting, by surmounting it all, I should serve as an expiatory victim and guard the tranquility of my companions. The children, in especial, I should thus fence about and absolutely save. I recall one of the last things I said that night to Mrs. Gross. It does strike me that my pupils have never mentioned... She looked at me hard as I musingly pulled up. His having been here in the time they were with him? The time they were with him and his name, his presence, his history, in any way. Oh, that little lady doesn't remember. She never heard or knew. The circumstances of his death? I thought with some intensity. Perhaps not. But Miles would remember. Miles would know. Ah, don't try him, broke from Mrs. Gross. I returned her the look she had given me. Don't be afraid. I continued to think. It is rather odd. That he has never spoken of him? Never by the least allusion. And you tell me they were great friends? Oh, it wasn't him, Mrs. Gross with emphasis declared. It was Quint's own fancy. To play with him, I mean. To spoil him. She paused a moment. Then she added, Quint was much too free. This gave me straight from my vision of his face. Such a face. A sudden sickness of disgust. Too free with my boy. Too free with everyone. I forbore for the moment to analyze this description further than by the reflection that a part of it applied to several of the members of the household, of the half-dozen maids and men who were still of our small colony. But there was everything for our apprehension in the lucky fact that no discomfortable legend, no perturbation of scullions, had ever within anyone's memory, attached to the kind old place. It had neither bad name nor ill fame, and Mrs. Gross, most apparently, only desired to cling to me and to quake in silence. I even put her, the very last thing of all, to the test. It was when, at midnight, she had her hand on the schoolroom door to take leave. I have it from you then, for it's of great importance, that he was definitely and admittedly bad. Oh, not admittedly. I knew it, but the master didn't. And you never told him? Well, he didn't like tail-bearing. 
He hated complaints. He was terribly short with anything of that kind. And if people were all right to him, he wouldn't be bothered with more. This squared well enough with my impressions of him. He was not a trouble-loving gentleman, nor so very particular, perhaps, about some of the company he kept. All the same, I pressed my interlocutress. I promise you, I would have told. She felt my discrimination. I dare say I was wrong. But really, I was afraid. Afraid of what? Of things that man could do? Quint was so clever. He was so deep. I took this in still more than probably I showed. You weren't afraid of anything else? Not of his effect? His effect? She repeated with a face of anguish and waiting while I faltered. On innocent little precious lives. They were in your charge. No, they were not in mine. She roundly and distressfully returned. The master believed in him and placed him here because he was supposed not to be well and the country air so good for him. So he had everything to say. Yes. She let me have it. Even about them. Them? That creature? I had to smother a kind of howl. And you could bear it? No. I couldn't. And I can't now. And the poor woman burst into tears. A rigid control from the next day was, as I have said, to follow them. Yet how often and how passionately, for a week, we came back together to the subject. Much as we had discussed it that Sunday night, I was in the immediate later hours in a special for it may be imagined whether I slept, still haunted with the shadow of something she had not told me. I myself had kept back nothing, but there was a word Mrs. Gross had kept back. I was sure, moreover, by morning, that this was not from a failure of frankness, but because on every side there were fears. It seems to me indeed, in retrospect, that by the time the morrow sun was high, I had restlessly read into the fact before us almost all the meaning they were to receive from subsequent and more cruel occurrences. What they gave me above all was just the sinister figure of the living man, the dead one, would keep a while, and of the months he had continuously passed at Bly, which added up made a formidable stretch. The limit of this evil time had arrived only when on the dawn of a winter's morning Peter Quint was found by a laborer going to early work, stone dead on the road from the village, a catastrophe explained, superficially at least, by a visible wound to his head, such a wound as might have been produced and as, on the final evidence, had been by a fatal slip in the dark and after leaving the public house, on the steepish icy slope, a wrong path altogether, at the bottom of which he lay. The icy slope, the turn mistaken at night and in liquor, accounted for much. Practically, in the end, and after the inquest, and boundless chatter for everything. But there had been matters in his life, strange passages and perils, secret disorders, vices more than suspected, that would have accounted for a good deal more. I scarce know how to put my story into words that shall be a credible picture of my state of mind, but I was in these days literally able to find a joy in the extraordinary flight of heroism the occasion demanded of me. I now saw that I had been asked for service, 
admirable and difficult. And there would be a greatness in letting it be seen, oh, in the right quarter, that I could succeed where many another girl might have failed. It was an immense help to me. I confess I rather applaud myself as I look back, that I saw my service so strongly and so simply. I was there to protect and defend the little creatures in the world the most bereaved and the most lovable, the appeal of whose helplessness had suddenly become only too explicit, a deep, constant ache of one's own committed heart. We were cut off, really, together. We were united in our danger. They had nothing but me. And I... Well, I had them. It was, in short, a magnificent chance. This chance presented itself to me in an image richly material. I was a screen. I was to stand before them. The more I saw, the less they would. I began to watch them in a stifled suspense, a disguised excitement that might well, had it continued too long, have turned to something like madness. What saved me, as I now see, was that it turned to something else altogether. It didn't last a suspense. It was superseded by horrible proofs. Proofs, I say, yes, from the moment I really took hold. This moment dated from an afternoon hour that I had happened to spend in the grounds, with the younger of my pupils alone. We had left miles indoors, on the red cushion of a deep window seat. He had wished to finish a book and I had been glad to encourage a purpose so laudable in a young man whose only defect was an occasional excess of the restless. His sister, on the contrary, had been alert to come out, and I strolled with her half an hour, seeking the shade, for the sun was still high and the day exceptionally warm. I was aware afresh with her, as we went, of how... Like her brother, she contrived, it was the charming thing in both children, to let me alone without appearing to drop me, and to accompany me without appearing to surround. They were never importunate, and yet never listless. My attention to them all really went to seeing them amuse themselves immensely without me. This was a spectacle they seemed actively to prepare, and that engaged me as an act of admirer. I walked in a world of their invention. They had no occasion whatever to draw upon mine, so that my time was taken only with being for them some remarkable person or thing that the game of the moment required, and that was merely, thanks to my superior, my exalted stamp, a happy and highly distinguished sinecure. I forget what I was on the present occasion. I only remember that I was something very important and very quiet, and that Flora was playing very hard. We were on the edge of the lake, and, as we had lately begun geography, the lake was the Sea of Azov. Suddenly, in these circumstances, I became aware that on the other side of the Sea of Azov, we had an interested spectator. The way this knowledge gathered in me was the strangest thing in the world. The strangest. That is, except the very much stranger, in which it quickly merged itself. I had sat down with a piece of work, for I was something or other they could sit, on the old stone bench which overlooked the pond, and in this position I began to take in with certitude, and yet without direct vision, the presence at a distance of a third person. The old trees, 
the thick shrubbery made a great and pleasant shade, but it was all suffused with the brightness of the hot, still hour. There was no ambiguity in anything, none whatever, at least, in the conviction I, from one moment to another, found myself forming as to what I should see straight before me and across the lake as a consequence of raising my eyes. They were attached at this juncture to the stitching in which I was engaged, and I can feel once more the spasm of my effort not to move them till I should so have steadied myself as to be able to make up my mind what to do. There was an alien object in view, a figure whose right of presence I instantly, passionately questioned. I recollect counting over perfectly the possibilities, reminding myself that nothing was more natural, for instance, than the appearance of one of the men about the place, or even of a messenger, a postman or a tradesman's boy from the village. That reminder had as little effect on my practical certitude as I was conscious, still even without looking, of its having upon the character and attitude of our visitor. Nothing was more natural than that these things should be the other things that they absolutely were not. Of the positive identity of the apparition, I would assure myself as soon as the small clock of my courage should have ticked out the right second. Meanwhile, with an effort that was already sharp enough, I transferred my eyes straight to little Flora, who, at the moment, was about ten yards away. My heart had stood still for an instant, with the wonder and terror of the question, whether she too would see. And I held my breath while I waited for what a cry from her, what some sudden innocent sign either of interest or of alarm, would tell me. I waited, but nothing came. Then, in the first place, and there is something more dire in this, I feel than in anything I have to relate. I was determined by a sense that, within a minute, all sounds from her had previously dropped, and in the second, by the circumstance that, also within the minute, she had, in her play, turned her back to the water. This was her attitude when I at last looked at her, looked with the confirmed conviction that we were still together, under direct personal notice. She had picked up a small flat piece of wood, which happened to have in it a little hole that had evidently suggested to her the idea of sticking in another fragment that might figure as a mast and make the thing a boat. This second morsel, as I watched her, she was very markedly and intently attempting to tighten in its place. 